tonight's focus will be the imaging tab. There's a lot going on here and there's a lot you can do on this tab and it's probably where you'll spend most of your time during the night once everything's set up and running. So it's important you understand uh, how the bits and pieces come together. Now I will mention that there are a number of components here that we'll go a little bit deeper into later uh, because they just require more attention and I think it's important that we talk about them uh, on their own. But we will just touch upon everything tonight. Now the first thing I wanna talk about is the fact that this interface is dynamic um, from a usability perspective, meaning you can make these panels larger or smaller by clicking and dragging on them. And you're gonna to have to figure out what works for your screen size. You'll also notice that there are panels that are individual panels, and then some panels have tabs, right? So we have multiple options here. Uh, and it's easy again to get lost if you're not sure what you're looking at. Now, if for some reason, let's say I just start closing things out and I lose my image and now I can't figure out where I am. If you ever get so lost that you think you need help getting back to the beginning, you can always go into options, imaging, and click this reset layout button and say yes. Now that's gonna bring the layout back. So if I come back to imaging, I'm back to the default layout of Nina. At the top, we have two sides to this top bar. The left is info and the right are tools. Now, starting over here on the left, we have image and you can see the title of this box here is image. So if I close it, it goes away. If I click it, it's going to come back and notice it came back down here as a tab. I can click and hold a tab and even reorder the tab. So now image comes before three point polar alignment. Now the image section is gonna be your primary focus for the evening. So let me just touch on that briefly here. In the upper left, we can zoom in or zoom out. We can fit to the frame size, or we can even zoom into 100% and go one to one. You can also use your scroll wheel to go in and out into certain sections as needed. Up here, we have the ability to do an aberration inspector. This is a three by three crop mosaic. And what this is doing is showing me the center of my image, the top left, top right, bottom right, and bottom left. And then again, the other components, it's taking pieces from the image to show me if I have any aberrations throughout the frame. So again, over here on the left, I might see a little bit of star elongation. So this is a good way to look at your current image and try to make a decision about whether or not something needs to be done. And again, this is typically about aberrations. So we're talking about things like distortion or chromatic aberration or even tilt problems with your image train. This next option here will plate solve your current image. So if I click on this, it will kick off a plate solve for that image itself. And basically it's gonna take the image and plate solve it. So it doesn't have to take a new image, it's using the image it already has. In my case, it ran it through ASTAP very quickly and just gave me some data about it. This option here will give you crosshairs on and off. You can see they're pretty dim, but they could be helpful if you're trying to center something very specifically in your field of view. This is the dynamic auto stretch on or off. This is for display purposes only. Your file will never be saved by Nina pre-stretched. This is just so we can see what's actually happening in our image. From an auto stretch perspective, there are some settings. If I go into options image, under advanced settings, these will help you with your stretching. The defaults are usually fine, but if you're having problems with the stretch view because of your camera, you can manipulate this. Up here we have star detection. Star detection is either on or off. You want to leave that on. We want star detection to happen. We will have HFR information up here and we'll also have HFR history down here. Another option once that's enabled is to go into your options and you can turn on annotate image. If I come back here to imaging and I know that I have HFR on, I can see that the stars that are detected have had their HFRs displayed. Now this is never saved in your image, but it may be something that's handy if you wanna see the type of HFR data you're getting. It clouds my image, so what I'm going to do is actually turn that off so that it's not the default for me. The final option here is a batten off analyzer. If you're using a batten off mask, you can actually go ahead and use this. And what we can do is center this 
around a specific star, we can use that data with a Batonoff mask. Now, obviously I don't have a Batonoff mask and I don't have a very bright star in this wide field. So this is sort of useless for me at this point. This option here is camera. You can see this is my camera panel here. It gives me information about the camera, some current information, but it also allows me to look at information about the cooling system and adjust the cooling and kick on cooling if it's not already running and also the warming if I need to get to it. It's important to understand when we talk about the imaging panel here in these sections, if the device we're presenting in a panel is related to equipment, the data you see will be specific to your equipment and its capabilities. The next option here is filter wheel. I can see my filter wheel is displayed down here. I can see my active filter is my HA filter and I could change this, although because I have a sequence running, I'm certainly not gonna do that right now. As you're going through your sequence, you should see your filter changes occur here as well. The next option we have here is the focuser. You can see my focuser is currently set as a tab. Now within the focuser, when I click on the tab, I can see its current position and temperature info. Again, this is device specific. I can see the target position, so I can set a specific target position here and click move and it will go to that position. Again, I'm not going to do that during a sequence. And I also have these options. This one will allow me to move in this direction by half of the currently configured autofocus step size. The second option here lets me move by five times the autofocus step size. And certainly I can go back in the other direction as well. So I have multiple options for moving my focuser right here from the imaging tab. I also have access to the rotator. Because I'm not using a real rotator, I'm not gonna be able to do much here. I'm actually using the manual rotator, which would force me to make physical adjustments. Telescope is the next option you can enable or disable. You can see here in the telescope section of the window, it's giving me information about my telescope and its current pointing. I do find meridian in as a pretty handy notation to tell me how far away I am from a meridian flip. In this case, it's telling me I'm 10 hours away because I'm actually already past the meridian for this target this evening. So I don't have to worry about a meridian flip occurring. Here I have guider. We can see guiders open at the bottom. This is basically mirroring what I have in PHD2. And you have all of the normal settings here. I can clear this, the data out. I can change it from reporting in arc seconds or pixels, and I can even change the X and Y scale information. The next section of data is the sequence. We can see the sequence is running and I can track that as it runs throughout the evening. If you have a switch, you can enable this here to see it. The switch typically allows you to power on and off various devices. If you're doing a weather integration, you'll have weather data that can be presented. If you have a dome, you can show that information as well. I do not have a dome. We have our statistics panel. We'll talk about that in a second here, but that's up top in the top right. We have HFR history information. We can see that's being tracked. Notice you have multiple options here in HFR history so that I can change what's on the left side of the table, what's on the right side of the table, and what type of data just in general I'll be presenting. I can also look at this for whatever filters have been available. Since I've only taken an O3 frame and an HA frame, that's all I can present. Here in less than a minute, when my current S2 frame is done, I'll have one of those frames as well. This allows me to track the HFR history throughout the night for each of the filters, as well as present other data. Also, you'll notice if an autofocus ever occurs, you'll see triangles at the bottom along this timeline from left to right as it progresses throughout the evening. If I have a flat panel, I can show that as well as a safety monitor. Now, before I move on to tools, let's talk a little bit about setting this interface up. Now, I have a rotator attached, but it's the manual rotator. It's not really of a lot of use to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that one. Now, the camera and focuser are interesting to me, but they're separate tabs right now. What if I wanted the focuser to not be in a tab, but have its own window that was presented all the time? Well, if I click and drag this tab somewhere on the screen, you'll notice I get this pop-up. I'm basically floating the focuser around the screen. This icon that is presented is basically telling me I can drop it here to the right side of the camera. I can put it to the left side of where the camera is. 
I can put it above the camera, below the camera, or leave it as a tab. So just as an example, and maybe a poor one at that, let me drop it to the right side of where the camera is. I let go of my mouse. Now notice in that block, it's now been split to camera and focuser. If I grab it again and drag it, I can actually put it somewhere else. Maybe I wanna put it here, or even I wanna put it below the filter wheel. I can do that as well. So you can see the drag and drop interface is something that you can customize any way you want. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of a couple of these that aren't presenting data because they're not that much use to me. Now remember, feel free to play with this interface. You can't break it. If you ever get lost or get it to a position where you just can't figure out how to fix it, go back into options and click reset layout. Okay, tools in the upper right hand corner. I can enable the imaging, which is up here in the right hand corner. This particular panel will let me take pictures. So right now this is grayed out. I can't start an exposure because I'm in the middle of a sequence that is taking images. If it were not, I could set an exposure time, choose the filter, change the binning and gain if necessary, and take a single picture and get results. I can also choose to save that image. By default, any image I take here is meant to be a temporary image and will not be saved to disk. I would have to turn that on. I can also choose to loop. Some of you are used to having a live view. In many cases, what we're gonna do instead is a loop here, where you'll set a certain exposure time of maybe one second or 10 seconds or a fraction of a second. Click loop here and then start taking pictures and it will begin to take one picture after another and continue to display that and stretch the data and show it to you on screen. We have image history. Image history is down in the bottom right. This becomes pretty interesting because there's a couple things here you may choose to use throughout the evening. So at any point in time, I can come back and say, well, I'd like to see this HA frame and take a closer look at it. I can click it to load it. It will come up here in the image section. I can then look at the picture and let's just say I didn't like this for some reason. Notice I can change that thumbs up to a thumbs down. Well, what does that do? Well, let's look in to where I'm saving these images. Here on 1016 is the North American Nebula I'm saving. And notice that it flagged that and prepended the word bad. You don't need to do this, but if you choose to do this, it can actually be a pretty handy way to flag images on the fly. And notice dynamically it will rename by prepending the bad flag to any images that you've given a thumbs down. The next option up here is plate solving. If this is not highlighted, I can click on it. Notice it opened here as a tab and I can go ahead and plate solve directly from here if I'd like to force a plate solve outside of a sequence. This is polar alignment. Because of the new three-point polar alignment plugin, I'm actually gonna ignore this as something I don't plan on using again. I have autofocus here. If I turn autofocus on and off, notice that it shows up and I can actually run an autofocus if I'm outside of an executed sequence. I can even look at previous autofocuses if necessary. Up here, we can actually enable manual focus targets. Notice here, we do have a list of common manual focus targets that are used for focusing or alignment. By default, it is going to be ordered from the top down by current altitude. So notice that Deneb is here at 64.34 degrees, and then it goes downward to other stars that are available to me. If I pick one of these, it'll give me the information and allow me to slew towards it. Of course, within a sequence, I'm also not gonna do that right now. Here's another option that I may cover later. This is the optimal exposure calculator. We're gonna leave that one alone today and maybe get into it later on in another video. And then finally, here's our three-point polar alignment. This is only available if you've added the plugin and I've already got that enabled here in case I need to do a polar alignment directly from within Nina. Now, the one last thing that I said we'd go into in a little bit more detail was the statistics window. And the only reason I wanna call that out is there's a couple pieces here that are interesting and we're gonna go into histograms later in another video in more detail. But notice here that it's showing me some information that may be interesting to you. So we've got the histogram displayed at the bottom from left to right. We've got the width and height of my sensor in pixels. I've got some other statistics, the mean, the median, 
the SD and MAD. So I've got various information. The mean is what most people find interesting. I've also got a min and a max, as well as other information like the bit depth of the camera, the gain, the current HFR of the frame on screen, and the number of stars that were detected for use for as HFR. The one thing I do want to point out before we get into a deeper video on this, if you right click on the screen, you can actually zoom in and get some values. So X and Y are where you are from a pixel-based location perspective. The K value is the value of that centered pixel. So it's a way for you to zoom in and see what ADU a certain part of your screen is at. Now this becomes more interesting when you're worried about blowing out something like a core of a galaxy or having stars that are so bright that they're bleeding over into additional pixels. So I know this was an overview and it really just touched upon everything that's on the screen, but I want you to be comfortable with what's there and not worry so much about closing a panel and thinking you can't get it back. You can get any of these panels back. You can move things around. You can resize them. Outside of a sequence, you can interact with various panels, but it's a very interesting interface that I think you need to be comfortable with. If you have any questions, let me know. Hopefully you found this helpful. Be on the lookout for more information about Nina, about astrophotography in general, and some other just additional related concepts. As always, like, subscribe, and share, and I hope to talk to you soon. Leave any comments, clear skies.